Today's video is kindly sponsored by War Robots. Find out more later in the video. Hey, 42 here. The modern world is a remarkable place. We live in an age where most of us carry around a device so advanced its basic functions would have looked like sorcery to our great-great-grandparents. How may I serve you? Where computers capable of exploiting the weirdness of quantum physics are trivializing feats of computation that would cripple the world's fastest supercomputers. And where McDonald's do home delivery. And yet, despite these truly stunning advances and bewilderingly complicated technology that underpins them, the most remarkable, complex piece of state-of-the-art tech ever created, at least as far as we know, has remained pretty much the same for the last couple of hundred thousand years. The human brain. Of all the assorted bits of meat that come together to form you, your brain is arguably the most important. When you look in the mirror, you see, well, you. And I'm not trying to freak you out here, but in a way, what you're actually looking at is a human brain attached to a life support machine and a bunch of pretty cool accessories. Okay, so it's a little bit more complicated than that, but the bottom line is this. Your brain is inseparable from you. And without it, you not only wouldn't be the person you are today, you wouldn't be a person at all. Or would you? Because whilst pretty much everything neuroscience tells us about the human brain confirms it is very much non-negotiable for anyone who fancies being a fully functional human, it just so happens that one man appeared to demonstrate that grey matter doesn't, well, matter. This individual, a 44-year-old Frenchman, visited his local doctor complaining of weakness in his legs. But on examining his patient, the doctor couldn't find any obvious physical issues, and so he decided a brain scan was in order. When the results came back, they were both shocking and extremely surprising. Because the scan did indeed suggest a possible reason for the man's malfunctioning legs, he didn't seem to have a brain. Or at least not the kind of brain anyone had ever seen before. It was absolutely tiny, just 10% of the normal size. If your average human brain is a big, strong workhorse, this man had somehow been saddled with a Shetland pony. And you can saddle yourself into the pilot seat of an epic war robot. War Robots is a worldwide, real-time, player vs player battle game in which you aim to fill your hangar with a collection of over 90 unique robots in order to dominate in legendary battles against other mechanical giants. Every robot possesses its own special ability, such as flying or dash. My personal favourite is Rhino, who has the assault ability allowing him to gain extra protection from his built-in shields. I really love the amazing graphics in War Robots, and the gameplay is so much fun. And the matchmaking facility is just fantastic. With over 190 million players worldwide, there's always someone to play with. I never have to wait long to jump into a match and start destroying enemy robots. You can download and play War Robots on your mobile phone or on your PC using my link in the description below, or just scan my QR code to receive a starter pack, which includes a robot with a weapon and a unique skin, 100 gold and 50,000 silver. Check it out. Okay, so first things first, where had the man's brain gone? Let's be clear, it hadn't fallen out. That probably isn't a thing. No, sections of this man's brain, the lateral ventricles, had slowly filled up with cerebrospinal fluid over the course of 30 years, gradually compressing the rest of his brain to a tiny fraction of the normal size. All of this came as a result of a condition known as hydrocephalus, which the man had first been diagnosed with as a six-month-year-old baby. At the time, he was treated through the insertion of a shunt to drain the brain of fluid. 
this technique worked, and the shunt was removed when he was 14. Which turned out not to have been the best decision, as his skull had been gradually filling right back up again with fluid ever since. What's truly remarkable about this story is that the man with the pygmy brain appeared to have been living a completely normal life in spite of his condition. In fact, neither he nor anyone who knew him had any idea there was anything wrong with him. He had a good job working as a civil servant, and he was married with two kids. There was nothing about his life that suggested he was suffering from catastrophic brain damage. It turned out he did have an IQ on the low side, at 75, very likely caused by the condition, but that's just about within the normal range. So how on earth is this even possible? We're used to thinking of the human brain as a powerful but somewhat delicate piece of machinery. I mean, there's a reason you wear a helmet when you ride a bike. Breaking an arm or a leg is usually little more than an extremely painful inconvenience. Breaking your head, on the other hand, is an instant game over screen. No extra life, no continues. And it isn't just unfortunate accidents that have taught us to be careful with our noggins. In response to the rising number of people residing in mental institutions, a man named Antonio Igaz Monez, who, for reasons I don't quite understand, looks like he should be on display at Madame Tussauds. Anyway, he pioneered a new kind of brain surgery to help people suffering from a variety of mental illnesses. The technique was so successful, it earned Moniz the 1951 Nobel Prize for Medicine. You might have heard of it, actually. The lobotomy. Yeah. As you're probably already aware, a lobotomy is an incredibly controversial surgery that essentially involves the severing of nerves linking various sections of the brain. Now, it has to be said, a good lobotomy, if that's ever a thing, could be surprisingly successful at eliminating the symptoms of mental illness. With the minor downside that common side effects included confusion, incontinence, mental detachment, and total personality deletion. And all of that from just snipping a few nerve fibres here and there. Which brings me back to my previous question. If comparatively minor damage to the brain is associated with such debilitating symptoms, how is it possible that a man whose brain was slowly squeezed to a tiny fraction of the proper size was even still breathing, let alone living a normal life without the slightest idea that anything was wrong with him? Well, despite those pretty shocking brain scans, the important thing to realise here is that the Frenchman's miniature brain still had all the important bits intact. The immense pressure inside the cranium hadn't destroyed his brain, or at least not much of it, only squished it. It was a bonsai brain, if you like. Small, but perfectly formed. If you were to lop the top of someone's skull off, Hannibal Lecter style, and violently compress their brain to 10% of its original size, you would no doubt kill them instantly, and make quite a mess in the process. But in the case of our unlucky Frenchman, the miniaturization process happened over a period of decades, giving his brain time to adapt to its new, cosier accommodation. Which just goes to show how adaptable the human body really is, even the brain. Early reports on this case suggested not that the man's brain had been squashed, but that 90% of his brain had been destroyed somehow. And if that had have been true, we would have had to completely reevaluate everything we thought we knew about the brain. After all, it simply is impossible for anyone to survive with large chunks of the brain missing. Or is it? Well, as it happens, our bonsai brain Frenchman isn't the only person in history to have pulled off the rather neat trick of living a fairly normal existence despite unimaginable damage to their brain. In 2014, neuroscientists reported on a case in which a 24-year-old Chinese woman was found to be missing a part of the brain called the cerebellum. Now, when it comes to the brain, Pretty much everything's important, 
but the cerebellum is particularly so. It's estimated to contain half the neurons in the entire brain, and it plays a key role in coordination, balance, language, emotion, memory, and attention. Most doctors will tell you that without a cerebellum, you don't really have a brain at all. And yet, somehow, this woman had managed without hers for 24 years. And much like our mini brain French bloke, she only discovered her predicament when she went to hospital complaining about seemingly unrelated symptoms of nausea and dizziness. Doctors scanned her brain and found simply a big black space where the cerebellum should have been. On further investigation, it did turn out there were a few clues not everything was quite right. The woman hadn't learned to walk until she was seven, and even then she struggled a little with movement. She also found speech difficult and wasn't able to make herself understood until the age of six. But even so, doctors were amazed she was even alive. Only eight other people are known to have survived for any length of time without a cerebellum. Usually, the lack of one causes death at an early age and is only discovered during an autopsy. Likewise, adults who suffer severe damage to the cerebellum, through a head injury for example, are typically unable to walk or even stand. How exactly someone can live a relatively normal life with a big chunk of their brain missing is still something of a mystery to medicine. But it seems that other parts of the brain are somehow able to compensate for the bits that are missing. We see this kind of thing happen in the brains of blind people, where the visual cortex is repurposed for auditory tasks. Another woman, American Michelle Mack, was only born with half a brain. Like the Chinese woman with no cerebellum, it had always been obvious things weren't quite right, and she did have some learning difficulties, but no one knew why. Doctors believe she had a stroke while still in the womb, and this meant the left half of her brain just didn't grow. But the right side did. It grew normally, and was able to compensate to a surprisingly large extent for the half that should have been there and wasn't. Accidental brain loss isn't the only thing that our brains can come back from. Some people have actually had half of their brain deliberately removed, usually as a treatment for severe epilepsy or another neurological disorder. One such person is Christina Sandhaus. In 1996, she had the entire right hemisphere of her brain removed. She was just eight years old at the time and had been diagnosed with Rasmussen's encephalitis, a rare brain disease that causes constant seizures. Christina would have up to 150 seizures per day, making her life near enough unlivable. Her doctors told the parents she would die if they didn't do something drastic. And something drastic is exactly what they did. The operation took 14 hours and half a brain, and it saved Christina's life. She grew up healthy, earned two degrees, and qualified as a speech pathologist. There are some serious downsides to the procedure, as you might expect. Patients lose the use of their hand on the opposite side of the body to the removed brain hemisphere, as well as vision on that side. But particularly if the surgery is carried out at a young age, many complex cognitive functions, things like memory and personality, develop completely normally. The truth is, we still don't know exactly how our brains are able to overcome things like being squashed to a fraction of their original size or chopped in half. Neuroplasticity certainly plays an important part. That's the ability for our brains to physically change in response to our environment. As does the fact that our brains are master multitaskers. Remember how I mentioned the visual cortex is repurposed in the brains of blind people to process auditory information? Well, it turns out that some level of auditory information processing goes on in the visual cortex of people who can see just fine too. Which sounds surprising, 
until you remember that the visual cortex is just a name we humans happen to give to that part of the brain based on our still fairly limited knowledge of what goes on in there. In recent decades, scientists have spent a lot of time trying to figure out which bits of the brain do what. But whilst we're able to associate certain activities with specific regions of the brain, it's becoming increasingly clear that things are much, much more complicated than that, and that multiple regions of the brain are typically involved with any one function. Which helps explain how, when one area of the brain is damaged, it's easier for others to pick up the slack. So, there you have it! Owning a fully functional brain may not be quite so important as you thought it was. Still, probably best to keep wearing that helmet when you ride your bike, just in case. Thanks for watching. Check out my new podcast, Random Interesting Facts, available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Link in the description below. Thanks.